Welcome to Valley Grove Baptist Church, located at 1731 South, U.S. Highway 281 in Stephenville, Texas. We are glad you joined us for our 1030 Sunday morning worship service. If you'd like to learn more about Valley Grove, please check us out at our website at valleygrove.net. Now, join us for the morning worship service already in progress. teaching to be baptized in uh, his name and for witness to the world. What we witness today is, is not only Christ's obedience, but we also witness uh, the fulfillment, the partial fulfillment of what God had intended. Hear the words of, of God to Abraham in Genesis 18, 18 and 19. Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. God's promised Abraham. He says, for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. So that, the Lord says, so that will bring about for Abraham what I have promised him. God made a promise to Abraham. I'm going to make you to a great nation and I'm going to bless the world through you. And the vessel I have chosen for that to happen is the family. So as you teach your family and your household to follow my ways, so in doing helps fulfill the blessing that I have intended. Christ is coming as a testimony not only to his uh, receiving Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, but also a testimony to a family of faith, teaching the ways to their children, and so helping to fulfill the promise that God made to Abraham so many generations ago. You keep in prayer for Christ as he is.
dead or worthless. In other words, if we have faith in God, but it doesn't lead us to do anything, of what good is that, right? So I think, in other words, he's saying, show your work. So here's what I want you guys to do. And remember, is whenever we have a Bible study or a lesson, whenever you have a Sunday school lesson, or even at this time, I want you guys not only to listen and to hear, but I want you to do your work. Can you do that? Yeah. yeah. I'm not going to give you a zero for laziness on your paper or anything, but we know that God's always watching us, right? Yeah. And so God wants us to show our work, to show what we've learned, to show others of what we believe in Him, right? Yeah. Let's say prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for these kids and what a joy and blessing they are to me, Lord, and to this church and to their families. I pray, Father, that even as we studied this morning, not only as children will they show their work, show their faith in you, but, Father, we as adults will do the same. Help us to lead them by example of showing out our faith in our work, of living out the things we study in your word and the things we hear. So, Father, let it be that the world will see our faith at work in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
and trust in Jesus Christ. And so today we're looking at righteousness missed and righteousness received. How many of you have ever gone on a trip and forgotten anything? Yeah? How many of you have gone on a trip and felt like you forgot something? Right? Spent the whole trip going, oh, did I do this? Did I turn the coffee maker off? Did I lock the front door? Did I bring this? Did I not? Isn't that just agonizing? I've gotten a new uh, uh, experience on this. It's not really all the trips and everything. Now I get home and sit down and Jen and I are talking and I'm going, I'm supposed to tell you something. I'm supposed to tell you something. <laughs> Anybody? There you go. So now I spend half my conversations trying to remember what we were going to talk about. Sometimes I remember and sometimes I don't. But isn't that a nagging feeling? How about going through life and going, oh man, I feel like I'm missing something. I think there's something more that's supposed to be happening. I think there's something more that I'm supposed to be latching onto and grasping. Wouldn't that be a horrible feeling? Going through life thinking there's something that I'm missing that I'm not grabbing onto. The truth is there's many in our world today that go through life just like that. And sadly, there's many that die in that exact state. Missing the most important element of life. Missing the purpose that God had ordained for their life and ours. Some of that is what Paul begins with here. Take your Bibles, turn to, to chapter 9 of Romans. Is this, there's, a, there's, there's an element of the population he's going to be addressing here. Here is the Jews that are missing out, he says. And quite frankly, if anyone should not be missing out, it's them. So Romans chapter 9, beginning verse 1. Let's just read the first five verses together. Follow along with me, if you will. Romans chapter 9, verse 1. Paul says this, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. In other words, Paul says, listen, I'm fixing to tell you something very important. And I'm telling you the truth. And my conscience gives witness to it. He says this. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish, or in other words, I wish I could, that my, I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Paul is saying this. He said, I'm telling you the truth. If I could, I wish that I would be the one to go to hell, that all of Israel would be saved. And he said, that's an honest statement. And he said, my heart is heavy. Because I know that there's many of my own people, many of my own race, many Israelites, of my people, my ancestry, they missed. They missed. And he said, it's breaking my heart. But then, listen to what else he says. He says, for the nation of Israel, for theirs is the adoption as sons. Theirs the divine, the divine glory. Theirs the covenants and the receiving of the law, the temple worship, the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, even the prophets. For them is traced human history of ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. So Paul says this. He says, I, I wish that I could be cursed forever, that, that my people, the Israelites, would receive Christ and be in relationship with Him forever. And in some ways he's saying that because it blows my mind that they missed it. I mean, theirs is the temple. Theirs are the patriarchs. Theirs are the experiences. They were the chosen one, the chosen one, chosen ones, let me get it right, of God. They're the ones that God, you know, parted the Red Sea for. They were the ones that experienced miracle after miracle after miracle. And yet, In some ways, my, Paul's mind is blown. How could Israel miss Jesus as Messiah? It's almost as if he's saying, you should know better, Israel. If anybody in the whole world should know that Jesus is the Messiah, it should be you. You've been watching for him. And yet when he came, you missed. You should know better. Jenna's first year of teaching, fifth grade. The class was actually McKinsey's class as they were coming through. Great class, wonderful kids, but they had some oddness about it. There was one little boy named Ryan that was in her class, and, and one day she looked over and she caught Ryan doing something he shouldn't have been doing. She looked at him, and Ryan immediately, his eyes went down, before she even said a word, except maybe, I think maybe she called him by name, Ryan! His response was this, I'm sorry, Mercedes. I 
didn't know you were looking. <laughs> she said, what do you mean you didn't know I was looking? Does it matter? Wouldn't you be acting right even if I wasn't looking? Well, I didn't know you were looking. Ryan, you should know better. I know your parents. They're good people. I know they've taught you right from wrong. You shouldn't have been doing that. Ryan, you knew better. That's what Paul is saying to Israel. Israel, you know better. You know who the Messiah should be. You know what the characteristics of the Messiah are. And yet, you missed. You should know better. Oh, do we hear those words today in our churches, in our nation? America? Where else is the gospel preached more than there? Where else is God's name proclaimed more than there? You've heard the good news time and time and time again. And yet you're rejected. But you should know that. Does he even say to the church? Church, there are things happening among you that shouldn't be. You should know better. There are things that, that people do, even in the name of Christ, or ones that have claimed the name of Christ, and you say that doesn't match up with the testimony of Scripture. You should know better. You see, it's not all about our knowledge, is it? It's about living out our faith as we talk to the kids. It's not enough to know the right path. We have to walk it out. Christ said even the demons know who God is. And they shudder. But that doesn't mean they walk out the path. Max Lucado, this week, heard a story. He'd tell a story. He said he was in the car. And he was very anxious one day. Really uptight. He was taking his daughter to school. And and, uh, and she noticed this. She said, Dad, why are you so anxious and uptight? He said, well, I've just got a lot of things going on. He said, I've got a book deadline that's coming up, and I'm just feeling the pressure. And he said, I'm just really anxious about it. And he said, all of a sudden, this little junior high age kid started teaching me again about our faith. She goes, Dad, this isn't the first deadline you've ever had. It's not always about that many. She goes, how many? <laughs> he goes, well, you know, 15. I've written 15 books, you know, up to that point. And she goes, and every one of them had a deadline? Yes, yes, every one of them had a deadline. And God helped you meet that deadline each and every time? Yes, God helped me meet that deadline each and every time. And so 15 times, Dad, God has helped you accomplish what lies before you today, and yet you sit there nervous about trying to accomplish what's before you today? It's almost as if she is saying, Dad, you should know better. Dad, God's hand has been over you all this time. God's hand will be with you in this. You should know better. You've experienced God at work in your life, Dad. Remember it and know better. A couple of years ago, I had a dear brother in Christ, a dear friend, one that I got to worry about. I didn't get a chance to speak to him when I tried. We had been in Bible studies together. I had led a Bible study with him and other men. We had spent many hours talking at different times about things. And I received word um, that he left his family. A wife and two children at home. And he left his family to be with the woman. I'm going to tell you, I was heartbroken, crushed. When I first got the news, I wanted to pull over the side of the road and throw up physically sick. And one of the first phrases that came to my mind was this. You should know better. We've studied God's Word together. Yeah, I know things get difficult, but man, you know better.
And when we do mess up, it's about living out reconciliation, seeking forgiveness, and living that out as well. I hear the words today roaring in my head. We should know that. For we are students of God's, God's Word. We are claimers of His name. We are followers of the Messiah. We should know better. And we should make it our purpose and goal to live out the testimony of Christ as best we can and at all times. Because it does matter. And we should know better. I think that's what Paul says here in Romans 9. He transitions it into Romans 10. Turn there with me. Romans 10. Let's begin in verse 2. Romans 10, verse 2, Paul says this. For I can testify about them that they are zealous, talking about the Israelites. They are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness that uh, that, know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Paul says this to the Israelites. I know their zeal. They've got great passion. But passion does not always equal truth. Just because they're passionate about something doesn't mean that that is the truth. They were passionate about trying to follow a law that would gain them righteousness through it. And Paul said they missed it. And even though they had great zeal, they still missed the mark. That's not where righteousness comes from. He goes on. Verse 5. He said, Moses described it in this way, the righteousness that came to, comes by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. He says, but listen, it doesn't come by works. And he shows that in verse 6. He says, but the righteousness that comes from faith says this. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend to heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend to the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. You know those verses always kind of trip me up. Those always kind of seem like odd verses. You know, who says, you know, go to descend to, to heaven with Christ or descend to the deep? Well, what does it mean? Basically what Paul is saying this is this. The, 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 the thrust of the passage is that, that a righteousness that comes from works is not attainable. In other words, to bring Christ down from heaven or up from the deep, from the grave. Those are God actions. It was God who Christ left the glory of heaven for to come to earth. It is God who raised Jesus up from the grave. Those are God actions, and those are actions that only God can do. So don't say to yourself, well, I must be like God and, and bring Christ down or raise Christ up. Paul says there's no works that you can do that will earn righteousness. Those are God actions. But God in His actions has provided a righteousness for you. But it doesn't come by your power to bring Christ down or to raise Him up. It comes by your faith. In Jesus Christ, who has come down, and who God has raised up, who died on the cross in your place. So Paul says it's not by works, because really the only works that can earn the righteousness are God works. But he says this about faith, beginning in verse 8, follow with me. He says, but what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we proclaim. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. For as the Scripture says, anyone that puts their trust in Him will never be put to shame. See, the burden of the passage is this, is to say that it's not by works that we're saved because though only God works can save our requirement is to put our faith and trust in the God who has done these things already. And Paul says it this way. He said the way that is done is through our heart and through our mouth. One through our heart, through our desire after God and God alone is the priority of our life. And then two, through our mouth as a confession to God in worship and as a confession to the world uh, of His greatness and praise and glory. So you understand, Paul said, it's not by works that we're saved, but it's by faith. And how is that faith expressed? It's expressed through our heart, and it's expressed through our mouth. 
So then it leads us to ask the question, what is it that our heart craves? What is the greatest desire of your heart? It's a heavy question. Quite honestly, it's a question that, that we wrestle with because we see our heart chasing after so many things. Maybe it's in seasons we chase after this or that or the other. But what is, truly, when you boil it down, what is the greatest desire of your heart? Paul says the greatest of your desires, the greatest desire of your heart should be bringing the Lord to God and being a father of his. Is that the desire of your heart today? What do you pray most? What is it that gives purpose to each and every day? Because truly, if God and following Him is not your greatest purpose, it's going to be like you're on that trip. Something's nagging. You forgot something. Something's out of whack. Something's missing. Because God has designed us and created us in His image. In an image that desires a relationship with Him. In a, in a relationship that craves for His attention and His time. To know more about Him. And to reflect it. What is your heart crave? What's the greatest desire of your heart? It's not a question you've got to answer for me. It's a question we answer for you. Each and every one of us. What's the greatest desire of your heart? He says that our mouth is also involved. Because the overflow of the heart, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, Jesus says. So what is it that we spend our time confessing? What is it that flows from our mouth? most importantly and most often? Do we spend time studying God's Word so that, that we may confess it back to Him in prayer? Do we spend time studying His Word so that the words that come out of our mouth may be a good reflection upon Him, may be a good witness and testimony to Him and to the world? What is it that comes out of our mouth? You know, today we have a beautiful thing called social media. Amen? Amen. What a wonderful gift. What a wonderful temptation. Amen? Many spend time on social media. Social media is not the issue. It's the confession of our mind, the desires of our heart that become the issue. Brother Bethel Baker shared this with me, and I just, I've got to read it to you. I've got to give him full credit, but I've got to read it to you. It says, this is for those of my older generation who do not truly comprehend why Facebook exists. He said, at present I'm trying to make friends outside of Facebook while employing the principles of Facebook. Therefore, I go down on the street every day to tell passers-by what I've eaten, how I feel, what I did the night before, and what I'll do tomorrow. I give them pictures of my family my dog, me gardening and spending time by the pool. And I listen to their conversations and I tell them I love them. And it works. I already have three people following me. <laughs> Two police officers and a psychiatrist. <laughs> I love that. I couldn't help all this year. Social media. It's great. It's wonderful. But what is the confession of our mouth? In other words, what are we known for by the people that are in our social media world? Maybe through Twitter, maybe through Facebook, whatever it is. What are we known for? What is the testimony of our lives, of our mouth, on Facebook? Because Paul says that the desire of our heart and the confession of our mouth ought to be that that gives worship, praise, honor, and glory to God. What is the desire of our heart? What is the confession of our mouth? What do we proclaim? Because remember, Paul says, if anybody should know them, it ought to be us. Amen. Chapter 11. Chapter 11, let's go to verse 22. Verse 22, chapter 11, Paul says this. Consider, therefore, the kindness 
and sternness of God. Well, let's just pause there for a moment. How many of you like to consider the kindness of God? Yeah, right hand. Okay. This section over here, we're wondering, right? <laughs> kindness of God. We like to consider. How many like to consider the sternness of God? But both are part of God. Right? I had a professor in seminary. One of the classes he taught, uh, he would begin by taking every chart board, grease board there was in the room, and he would write, love, justice, love, justice, love, justice, love, justice. And he would write it on one board and go all the way around the room until it connected to it. His point was this. He said, in Scripture, in the life we understand, in the true characteristics of God, that God's love and justice are never disconnected. <coughs> that we never truly understand God's love if we do not understand God's justice. We never truly understand God's justice if we do not understand God's love. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. Amen? And we say, thank God for His love for us that Jesus would die in our place. Right? Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Because of our sin. Our sin had to be paid for. There was a justice that had to be meted out. And Jesus said, I will take the judgment that comes with your sin and show you my love on the cross. Justice and love forever lived. Scripture says that those whom God loves, He disciplines. Love and justice. Why does the discipline come? Because of justice. But it's always connected with love. In other words, He disciplines so that changes will be made so that the blessings will come. He does that out of love. We're not out of love. We're the only justice and love forever connected. God's kindness and sternness to me are a reflection of love and justice. And they forever link. I want you to watch a video. Now some of you, you look at the video and go, well, what does that have to do with this? I want you to just sit and absorb the information from the video.
something similar to that in times past. It's not new, but quite honestly, every time I watch it, come out. They're also not at all. Maybe even it sums it up best, you know, trying to wrap our mind around it, that there are more stars in the sky than there are grains of sand on the earth. And yet there's more atoms and more grains of sand than there are stars in the sky. How big is our God? We can understand and control the smallest things we can't even see. And so I stand in awe. And so whenever I come to worship, I don't come to worship going, God, you should not be stern. God, you should only be kind. God, I don't understand love and justice. And, I, and therefore, if I can't understand it fully and completely, then there's no way it can be wrong. We've experienced the moving of His Spirit. We know better. 